Hello, and thanks for joining us for the first in our webinar series that celebrates the 50th anniversary of the National Center for Higher Education Management Systems, otherwise known as NCHEMS. Many of our staff members have specific expertise in higher education issues and practices. Today, we're featuring Dennis Jones as he and his guests look back on the last 50 years and reflect how things have changed or not. I'm Sally Johnstone. Liz, could we go to the next slide? The current president of NCHEMS. And before I turn this over to Dennis, let me explain our format. We will be listening to the panelists discuss a set of issues for the first part of the webinar. Then we'll ask them to respond to your questions. Next slide. I'm also joined today by two of my colleagues here at NCHEMS. Sarah Torres Lugo will monitor the questions that you want to ask the panelists, and Liz Weeks will be running the webinar. Next slide. To pose a question or a comment, click on the Q&A in the controls. And if you're in a full screen mode, you might need to hover your mouse over your screen to make the controls visible. Once you click on Q&A, a window will appear. Type your question in the text field and click send to submit it. If you want to pose a question to a very specific person or a panelist, please make sure to begin your question with the name of that panelist. The chat will not be monitored, so please only use the Q&A feature. Let's get started, and I'll turn this over to Dennis, who's going to get us going. Thanks, <laughs> thanks, Sally. I was asked to kind of lead this, the first of a series of webinars marking NCHEM's 50 years of involvement and leadership in higher education, largely because I've been a staff member at NCHEM's for all but a very few months of those 50 years of NCHEM's existence. And over that period, I've had a front row seat as the higher ed policy environment has evolved over a very long period of time and have had my hand in building a set of tools that have attempted to help management and managers and policy makers deal with the changes in this changing environment over that period of time. As I've looked back at how one would kind of organize this conversation, I came to the conclusion that it would be useful to follow four different strands of conversation. There are lots of ways this could have been done, but these four work for me. The first of these is the nature of policy as it affects students or reflects uh, the importance of dealing with student issues. The second is the focus on institutions and how policymakers think about the important issues of creating and then utilizing institutions of higher education. The third is, and it's key in both institutional and state policy, the central purposes of how we deal with financing higher education. And finally, the nature of accountability as it affects institutions and agencies of higher education. Before we get into this conversation, I want to introduce the two individuals who are joining me on this panel. Um, first, Pat Callen. Everybody knows Pat. I will give you just a little bit about his background. Pat was the head of higher ed agencies in Montana, Washington, and California. He was the vice president at the Education Commission of the state, president of the California-based Institute for Higher Education Policy and President of the National Center for Public Policy and Higher Education, the latter group uh, most notable for bringing us measuring up. David Longenecker, uh, 
worked first at the Federal Office of Management and Budget, was the head of higher education agencies in Minnesota and Colorado, assistant secretary for post-secondary education in the U.S. Ed Department, and finally, uh, most recently, the president of the Western Interstate Commission for Higher Education. Both of these individuals are scholars who have studied and written extensively about higher education policy, but they are also individuals who have had their hands deeply in experiences in shaping that policy on both state and national levels. That bit of background, let's go to the next slide. I'm going to, we're going to, tee up these four uh, major threads of higher education policy and the changes therein. Uh, one at a time, I'm going to introduce each one and then ask uh, David and Pat to uh, chime in with their perspective on these topics. So let's start with the student-focused part of all of this. When NCHEM started, the whole agenda was accommodating growth. The major reason that NCHEMS came into being was the question of how does one respond to the flood of baby boomers coming into higher education and how to rationalize institutional expansion and the creation of higher education capacity. <clears throat> One of the first models that NCHEMS built was the Resource Requirements Prediction Model, uh, a model designed to predict the resources required at institutions to accommodate growth of various kinds. Just to show not only the change in policy direction, but the nature of change in technology, that model was 50,000 lines of COBOL code, uh, a very different model than anything NCHEMS is now building. That policy focus shifted in the 80s to one in which the emphasis was on ensuring access, not just accommodating growth of uh, enrollments of students who were knocking at the door, but the question was changed to say who's not coming to college and what barriers do we have to remove for them, and particularly underrepresented minorities and low-income <laughs> students. Uh, equity in attendance and access became much more important. And then most recently, it's become apparent that access is not a sufficient end. It's important that the students who come in to the front doors of higher education, succeed in completing a program of study. That <clears throat> this is not just for the benefit of individuals, it's a social and economic imperative that more residents of the US, more students, more individuals get college degrees if the country, if our states are to be economically and socially successful. So with that introduction, I'm going to turn it to Pat. And as somebody who has been deeply involved in ensuring access and student success, I'd like to invite you, Pat, to make a set of comments. Uh, thanks, Dennis. So it, uh, it seems to me that the uh, for all the uh, success, uh, using NCHEMS tools and, and others uh, of the last half of the 20th century. Um, it was a very different kind of time in the sense that we met most of the labor market needs, um, uh, you know, w with a reasonable lapse time uh, during that period of time. And uh, while we, the system did not provide individual opportunity the way it's needed today, um, the world for people who didn't get it, as unfair as that might have been for some, uh, for many, uh, 
there were alternatives uh, 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 in the industrial society where people could get in a middle, get a middle, uh, have a middle class life without education and training beyond high school. Now we see the reason we're, I think, pressured to be so student focused, uh, which I, I think we've accomplished only in a fairly uneven way to date, is because there is simply no talent to spare for the sake of individual opportunity and for the sake of the economy. Most Americans need education and training beyond high school, and that uh, that's compounded by the demographic shifts uh, in the society and the preoccupation currently with um, with uh, uh, income inequality, uh, educational attainment inequality, uh, and uh, concerns about social mobility. So I think it's important to realize the societal push uh, uh, that causes us to have this concern. And I think we're somewhere, the policy rhetoric is much better than the reality of student folks' uh, 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 policy. We know more about how to do it. We have plenty of success stories, but it's not a systemic, uh, uh, it's not, there's not the kind of systemic improvement we need uh, to develop the necessary talent uh, in, in American society. David? Yes, I agree with both, uh, with all that both Pat and Dennis have said, but I think there's also something that uh, is really very important in that shift. Um, uh, in terms of what share of the population needs to be educated and uh, and how well. I think it's not just that we are focused on the equity concern. Certainly that's the, our policy rhetoric. But a lot of it is we shifted from a concern about what it means for people to what it means for our economy, our industry and whatever. And so to some extent our focus has changed from we need to do this for the population to we need to do this for the economy and the population is just there to support the economy. Uh, it's sort of a reverse of where I think we used to be in terms of philosophy, whereas the economy was there to support the people. It's now that the people need to be there to support the economy. And I think that leads to a very different thrust. Now, our rhetoric is still very heavy around the equity agenda. Uh, certainly our policies, as they're evolving, are in that regard. But I think if we look at our practice, there's certainly been changes in the way in which we treat students, if you will. I mean, not so much at the federal level. The federal level has really been sort of following rather than leading. It's been very incrementalist in its policy on students and on labor force. The states, on the other hand, have really changed the way in which they look at students. They talk a lot about equity and success but they shifted a tremendous amount of the burden for paying for this uh, from the state to the students. Uh, now, some of that was out of necessity in the recessions, but some of it was out of simply the fact that the market seemed to bear those increases in price, and, uh, and indeed that evidence is pretty strong. Also, families have changed the way in which they support their children, uh, and part of that was out of necessity in the two recessions. But if you take a look, families are picking up a much smaller share of the overall burden uh, than they used to. So while our rhetoric sounds pretty good, I think this, there is this a sort of nefarious element that says this isn't about the people, it's about the economy. And I think there is a real shift in the states, driven by, uh, in part by necessity, but also by, by convenience. Okay, next slide please. Talk just for a couple of minutes about institution focused policy. And as I indicated in my opening remarks, initially the focus was entirely on creating capacity. How do you build enough institutional capacity to deal with the numbers of students who wanted to come in to university life? Uh, and this, we saw lots of Community colleges being built early, in late in the 60s, early in the 70s, <coughs> and you know, the rhetoric in some states was we will have a institution of higher education of some form within 30 or 50 miles of every resident. Uh, and the question then became one of rationalizing the organization of this capacity 
and defining institutional role and missions. Uh, how many research universities versus uh, comprehensive four years, two years, and et cetera. That conversation is pretty much gone, although we still have uh, the conversations about role and mission around two-year institutions, assuming four-year missions, et cetera, et cetera. But the bigger part of the current conversation is about utilizing the capacity that's been built to serve the needs of, of society and of the citizens within that society. Uh, you know, the list of, of agenda items is on this slide. I'm not going to read them, but it, they amount to using higher education to serve the public agenda. Um, you know, when, when I started in this business, it was, you know, like Charlie Wilson, what's good for General Motors is good for the country, and what was good for higher education was good for the country in those days. Now it's much more a question of what does the country need from higher education? What do states need from higher education? That's among the most sharply defined change in public policy conversation. I'm not going to say that we've turned that into action, but I'm going to turn to David first in this instance and, and uh, let him react to those statements. Yeah, I think you've picked up the, the trends that have occurred. I would tell you, as a person who's phasing out of the career in higher education, probably my most disappointing element is the inability of our institutions <laughs> and institutional policy to focus on how we can do better with less. In fact, the way we are probably, given the SHEO data, one could make the case that we're less productive today than we have ever been in the history of American higher education. If measured by the cost of production, uh, currently our institutions have more funding than they have ever had before, before on a per student basis. Now that's not universally the case, but it is the average uh, over everything. And it, as I look at the way in which our institutions responded to two very serious economic downturns, their focus was almost entirely, not in exclusively, but almost certainly much more heavily focused on how they could generate more revenue in new ways, rather than how they could reduce expenditures. And how we could, how not only how they could reduce expenditures, but how they could reduce the ever increasing demand for more expenditures on a per unit basis. Um, it's, we have this uh, appetite for more funds that seems now uh, to be almost insatiable. Now there are ways in which we're trying to change that a little bit, uh, but they're not essentially the ways one might look at trying to improve the efficiency and effectiveness, just ways of reducing costs. We're focusing more on outsourcing to organizations like Straight or Line and other uh, types of organizations. Those are fine places, but they aren't substantial uh, systemic changes internally to the way in which we operate. We're also uh, relying much more heavily on adjunct faculty and part-time faculty Again, not what we might want to do. We aren't looking at the fundamental ways in which we deliver this service and that we could do it uh, more efficiently. Almost every other industry is doing that, but we aren't. And yet we, we had to survive, and we did survive, two very substantial um, recessions in public higher education, particularly at the state level. And we didn't see the kind of reform that I think institutions might have been about. We're charging more uh, to students, in part because we had to, because the states had moved away from their support, but in part it was simply because we could, and they would pay more, and so we, we charged them more. Uh, and so I'm very disappointed and uh, not terribly optimistic about how we uh, progress into the future in terms of our role and mission public and public agenda. Pat? So let me uh, agree with start with uh, agreeing with uh, with Dave that all of these uh, prior state priorities, which I think you've identified uh, correctly, Dennis, uh, uh, no, that they the achievement of any of them depends on addressing this cost productivity question. There's simply no way we get from here to there in the in the real world without uh, uh, without 
doing that, and and uh, there simply are are not the resources. And and I think we're uh, given the changing demographics, given the income of the potential student population, we need to reach to address the social economic gaps. Uh, that the uh, the 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 tuition route may be limited uh, if we're serious about. Uh, about that, uh, so that's the first point. And the second point is what the public agenda to me means is that we, especially in public policy and especially the states and especially uh, uh, to some extent institutional leaders, it means that we address, it means we define success in terms of our impact on students and on the needs of, uh, of society and not simply by our uh, competitive, our place in the competitive hierarchy uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, of institutions of higher education. You could have a number of great institutions in a state where you have undereducated populations and, uh, and, and an economy which is floundering. Uh, and then just let me say by way of note that I think the issues of capacity, uh, we, I didn't hear you saying this, Dennis, but I want to say we, I don't think we can quite declare victory on those. I think the capacity issues may be different now. Uh, people looking for uh, education in areas where there is employment, but we, uh, we, we're we not able to accommodate them in higher education. All the national press about computer science, the, uh, the, the, uh, the Scott Curse book on the Silicon Valley where you have demand for programs on Student side and on the uh, on the employer's side, for which we simply don't have the capacity. And then finally, I don't I don't know how we uh, uh, address this, but I think the role and mission questions. Uh, the, I think a question states need to ask in in light of this very different environment, as far as the need to educate more people, is if you step back and look at uh, the resources allocated to uh, instruction or research, whether we don't have uh, big allocational inefficiencies there that are uh, that are partly responsible for the cost uh, problem that we're not addressing so well. Yeah, I'm just you know, my my observation in this one is that <laughs> that we need badly uh, a different approach to delivering post-secondary education for many kinds of programs and many kinds of students. And there's very little in the policy world that shapes those kind of changes. And there certainly is not much in mainstream higher education that is willingly making the changes that I would say are necessary to make. Next slide, please. When we talk about Higher education policy, it almost always starts and in many cases ends with a conversation about money. And for much of my career, the focus on higher education funding really was about how do we pay for uh, building capacity and equally importantly, how do we make sure that the institutions get treated, quote, fairly, that uh, some institutions didn't get more money than, more than their share of state appropriations, et cetera. That has, at least again in rhetoric, turned to a focus on paying for production of, of, product, of uh, priority outcomes. And lots of states now have outcome-based funding as a bow in that direction, although I would say that just because they haven't doesn't mean that it really is effective and almost no state isn't. Uh, and the other piece, because of the reasons that, that David in particular just mentioned, we have an ongoing and major conversation about affordability. The, the point being that we need more students to come into higher education or post-secondary education, the students that need to come into that sphere uh, are students who have relatively modest economic means, uh, all the folks with high incomes and, and lots of resources are in higher education and have been, so 
uh, getting more low income students in is important. And the question then is more low income students, we keep raising tuition. How do they pay for the education we need for them to have? Uh, and you know, again, when I started, the Carnegie Commission drew a line in the sand and basically said, state should put up two thirds, students should put up one third. We now have moved to a place where more than half of the states have created circumstances in which students are the primary funders of their post-secondary education enterprise. Uh, you know, we're a long ways from higher education being defined realistically as a public good. It's We've defined it increasingly as a private good in spite of the fact that we're framing the need for it in state and national economic terms. So with that background, I'm gonna turn back to Pat to lead this piece of it. So to reinforce really what you've just said, Dennis, the, uh, uh, how have we prepared as a country and as states and as institutions for the most um, uh, uh, economically, uh, 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 the, uh, the most economically, I guess, and ethnically and racially diverse population uh, in the history of American higher education that's in our pipeline, as well as uh, some that aren't, like adults that we're going to have to serve, uh, people that we absolutely have to bring in uh, and educate well in order for uh, for them to have it, the kind of opportunity that Americans feel increasingly they don't have, and for the economy to uh, function well. Well, we prepared for that by making it uh, making higher education, uh, as David suggested, both less productive but also uh, more uh, you know about more, more expensive. And so this is a uh, uh, <laughs> it it it's a, a real mismatch between. Uh, societal needs and 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 then secondly the the kind of uh, si uh, if, uh, the kind of uh, uh, if you want to call it the financing of American higher education is uh, is the place where I think the most radical change has occurred in the last several decades and that has not been policy driven uh, there's been very little policy driven and 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 and, and it's been sort of more how opportunistically driven i suppose uh uh and uh, by states and institutions and and uh finally that we part of the finance po uh, the policy has to be a real look at how uh how federalism in, works in fact in in the funding of higher education and whether it's uh, uh whether it's as uh, dysfunctional as i think it is David? Yeah, I think this one, uh, uh, first of all, I think finance is basically the policy that drives where you go uh, because you follow the money. Uh, but I think this is where we have, uh, we ne nearly have a conundrum because you mentioned, Dennis, that uh, we used to expect one third from the students, two thirds from uh, the state. That was at a time also when we expected that about one third of the population would need a higher education and about two thirds would be able to be served with something less. That second piece has really almost reversed. We now say about two thirds of the population need to have some post-secondary education, maybe one third, uh, not so much. And yet we still have basically the same pool of funds now to try to serve virtually uh, double the numbers of what we were talking about at a previous period of time. And that's a really a conundrum about how you deal with that. Our response to a great extent has to be re to rely on community colleges to find a way to serve those who weren't as well prepared as those uh, who were coming to the four-year institution. Uh, and, we, and we continue to treat those community colleges with funding that was at about half the level of the funding we could provide to the other. So it was a way of sort of living with that conundrum I was talking about. But that doesn't work because you can't really provide the quality of education you need for students who are less well prepared with less funding than you uh, spend on those who are more prepared and yet that's been our strategy we have to find a way in which we can deal with that our rhetoric here has been really strong i think uh, and i'm a very strong proponent of 
um, performance funding because I think that it helps to drive increases in productivity. But the gap, the disconnect between our policy and our rhetoric here is very substantial from what is happening at the state and the federal level and how institutions are responsive. Response. Much of the need is for adult students. Uh, community colleges have reached out to those, but it's not nearly as significant a reach uh, uh, an effort we have we seen on the part of four-year institutions. Uh, we're, we're relying more heavily, and we should be, on technical and trade ed, uh, opportunities that are less than the baccalaureate. That makes sense. But we don't want to relegate that to uh, all poor students to those jobs. Um, uh, we're also, many of our institutions are still trying very much to get into mission creep, creep. We used to, we talk a great deal of supporting strong research, but in fact, we support strong and weak re research in our general model of providing education in the four-year institutions. So we've got to come to grips with some of the real inconsistencies between our rhetoric and our practice. Next slide, please. The final one of these four threads that I uh, put on the table is the conversation about accountability. And again, early in my career, the entirety of the conversation about accountability was focused on finance. It was uh, an issue of were funds expended in the ways specified in the in the appropriation bill, um, and lots of time and energy being devoted to making sure that money wasn't used from bucket A to support the activities in bucket B. Now there's much more conversation about accountability for outcomes or performance. Did students complete programs? Are underserved students being successful? Are students uh, gaining requisite knowledge and skills in their educational programs? What are the learning outcomes? And in many states, uh, the question of employment outcomes, are students getting jobs and are they getting jobs at levels of, of pay that will let them pay back their student loans? Uh, that accountability has changed dramatically from uh, 50 years ago to now. David, are you with me? No, I can't argue with you. Uh, I think, uh, actually, I think there's both good and bad news here. Uh, the not so good news is that we still don't measure student learning. Uh, we, um, and uh, so nobody knows really whether the students are learning what they need to know or not, at least not to the extent that we should. should. And what's also, I think, interesting is that while we're very strong proponents of other industries using our research to help guide their changes and increases in productivity, as an industry, higher education is very slow to follow the research and the evidence. A couple of classic examples in this, the most significant one in, in, in uh, modern times is the idea of free tuition. Uh, we know that's not a very good idea, it's not a very efficient idea, it's not a very productive idea, but it's a very popular one. And so we've got free tuition just all over the place. But the evidence doesn't support that as uh, anywhere near the optimal approach uh, to moving forward. Um, so we've got, uh, I think, some real problems. The good news is, I think, that we really have had some substantial changes in accountability and what we're expected to do in a variety of important areas. We now are focused on completion, not just entry. Uh, so access is not, equity is not just defined as access, it's access to success. I think that's a huge change in the philosophy and in some of the accountability schemes that exist. We're, uh, we're legitimizing non-baccalaureate education as useful and legitimate for the workforce. I think that's positive. We might overemphasize that for some of the wrong reasons, but I think that's important to us and it's very legitimate. And we've got a huge effort, uh, at, at particularly at the state level, to focus on equity gaps and ways to bring to eliminate those uh, or reduce those equity gaps. So I think there's some really good news on the accountability side, but we've got a long way to go. Pat, then we'll get to questions from the audience. So, uh, 
I think the policy rhetoric about accountability is pretty is 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 substantial. Uh, but it seems to me we're at the heart of it. Accountability is about articulating the public purposes of the enterprise, measuring progress and monitoring progress and addressing them by institutions, and then connecting that progress to the uh, uh, to the financing uh, of higher education so that incentives are appropriately structured. And I'd say uh, uh, it's connecting those dots uh, that we're not uh, that we're not doing well at, despite all of the uh, positive things that David uh, uh, I, I, I just uh, identified. And I think the tension on uh, between kind of institutional self-interest and public purposes can and should and always will be there, but I think it's still tilted, uh, despite the rhetoric, uh, towards uh, the, uh, the the more narrow competitive uh, status-seeking behavior of institutions than it is towards a clear definition of public purpose. And the state seeing itself it, through one mechanism or another as the steward of those public purposes. Okay, Sally? Yes, thank you, Dennis and Pat and David. Before we turn this over to Sarah for some questions from the audience, I wonder if each of you might say something about where we should be going. Uh, where we should be going is to take Pat's words to connect the dots. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, the last slide that, that we've got uh, here, let's put it up for just a second because I think it addresses that, that point, the next one, Pat. Because what we've been saying consistently in this is that the rhetoric around higher education has changed substantially about students, about institutions, finance, accountability. But practice has changed much less. Uh, that practice has not kept pace with expectation in any way, shape, or form. And you know, NCHEMS got started largely on the belief that uh, better data, better information would improve decision making in post secondary education. And I think that over the years, through NCHEM's efforts and through the efforts of other organizations, the data and analytic capacity has in fact been created. And now we are at a position where we have much more capacity in that arena than we have demand for the use of it. Uh, and so where we need to go next uh, is to understand that uh, the tools that we've had in the past for higher education was a growth industry uh, are insufficient to the present where higher education is a mature industry uh, and that the leadership <laughs> tools and skills that we've built over the years don't work in the new environment. So. Uh, attention to a whole new array of leaders and leadership skills is where we have to spend our time. Dave, do you want to respond to that? Yeah, yeah I, just a couple of things. One is I think we have to be, uh, first of all, everybody's sort of talking the right line now, but we aren't, uh, the dots aren't connected. And a couple of the dots that aren't connected at all, well, and they haven't been, and we need to think a lot about it is how state and federal policy work together. Uh, we talk, you used to talk about the triad and everything, but in terms of the finance policy and other things, uh, many of the things the states are doing today are just frankly stupid, given where federal policy is. Let, let's use tuition policy as an example. You get free tuition, guess what? You just gave up uh, a substantial federal responsibility. The feds ought to just love those free tuitions because they no longer have to provide a tuition tax credit to those people because they don't have any taxes. All you're doing is shifting who's going to provide the free education from the states, from the feds to the states, and these are the states that don't have the resources to do the job in the first place. 
So, I mean, we've got to have much more intentional in this federalist system that we have. We have to be much more intentional about the states who have the primary responsibility for post for, for, for post-secondary education, working with and, if you will, using to their advantage federal policy. And we haven't done that very well. The other thing I'd just like to mention is, you know, data may, uh, uh, Dennis uh, has sort of become the guru on the change from thinking about data to thinking about data, uh, the information you get from that data. Paul Lingenfelter, who's a friend of all of ours and, and a former colleague, um, has just written has just written a nice book, and he makes a distinction to the third level, saying we have to now move from information to knowledge, and knowledge is the use of information in a uh, in an informed fashion. And I think that's part of our dilemma is that we've we we uh, we've had some very important and useful information, but somehow we haven't been able to accumulate that into knowledge in our community that leads to the policies that we really need to make the strides that we've got. And we've got to become convinced. To go. The one other thing I'd say is we've got to get back to understanding the importance of teaching as part of this, uh, particularly in our four-year institutions. This, isn't, this doesn't apply to our two-year institutions, but our four-year institutions have become so enamored of the scholarship and research portion of their environment that they have substantially reduced teaching both philosophically and practically as a part of the job of faculty, that it has grossly uh, reduced our product, teaching productivity, and we can't afford that any longer. We have to become proud and comfortable with our teaching role. Thanks. So uh, I think we're sort of recapitulating here, but it seems to me the policy conversation uh, uh, in the country really outstrips uh, 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 behavior, be outstrips reality. And the data and analytic capacity, thanks to NCHEMS uh, largely, is uh, uh, our ability to understand issues and envision solutions uh, outstrips our capacity to make institutional changes. I'm, I'm not positive. I would, phrase, I would frame it quite the way David did, though I don't disagree with it. it it's 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 less about I me about about knowledge of how to implement specific practices than how to take uh, intractable <laughs> institutions and create a capacity for change. And I think it's largely about a hope that we can sort of tweak our way to the kind of um, a rather large scale change that we need for American higher education to work uh, in the rest of the 21st <coughs> century. And what we need is it's not so bad. It is not so severe as blowing things up, but it's a lot more than uh, than a series of, uh, uh, of of uh, of tweaks. And I think that comes down to to some extent to, to leadership in both public policy and in uh, uh, in institutions. We 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 need some big ideas, uh, even if, if the ones in the Truman Commission. It takes us decades to implement them all. And, and not simply living off the capital uh, in terms of the way we do for education and the way we and how and the way we uh, pay for it and the cost of it that we're uh, really products of uh, of 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 this uh, 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 growth period in the 21st century. So you know my my sense is uh, we're really not having the right conversations, including the conversation about federalism and and finance but finance is a means to an end we really need to uh, uh, think more deeply and more seriously about institutional uh, uh, change and leadership I think thanks could we go back a slide Liz uh, Sarah do you want to pose some questions from the audience for our panelists yes Sally we'll begin with a comment that we received from an audience member and this would be to all panelists. The comment reads, the other question is, if there are more low-income students entering post-secondary institutions, what institutions do to accommodate them and ensure a diverse, equitable experience? Would you please react to that comment? We can go ahead and begin with Dennis. Can you read it again? Because I missed the middle part of that, Sarah. So this was when you were talking about finance policy, and so it reads, the other question is, 
if there are more low-income students entering post-secondary institutions, what will the institutions do to accommodate them and ensure a diverse, equitable experience? Would you please react to that comment? Yes. Yeah. I mean, again, now we're talking about going to the core of teaching and learning and the, the student experience. And in this realm, uh, you know, there are institutions, uh, numerous of them, that have performed extraordinarily well with students that historically have been left out of the higher education mix. And we can talk about Georgia State, uh, others of that ilk that have focused on <laughs> being very attentive to students, doing intrusive uh, advising and counseling, using big data to track student success and student lack of success. And we know how to do these things. It's not that this is a big mystery. What is the big mystery is why we cannot get many of these practices implemented at scale uh, and the issues are part public policy because we keep creating incentives for business as usual uh, but part of it is uh, i would just say almost sheer laziness on the part of the enterprise uh, that refuses to take from the knowledge that we have and apply it to the problems that we all recognize. Thank you, Dennis. And Dave, do you have any comments? Yeah, I jump in. I think that we do have a new tool that we, <laughs> we don't know everything about yet, but I think it, it's going to help us a great deal. And that is basically predictive analytics and the use of big data. Uh, I think there is much that we can use the, those and the use of technology, uh, including artificial intelligence, to really help us figure out ways on an individualized way to provide more adaptive uh, learning processes for individuals that are tailored to the individual. Um, and so I think there are some very strong tools out there to help us do this. But we can't rely on just one sector of higher education, the community colleges, to do this. This has to be embedded throughout higher, uh, our system of higher education so that better, we're serving students better in virtually every sector. Uh, and uh, uh, thank God for our community colleges uh, being there, but they can't be the whole answer for this equity uh, agenda that we have in front of us. Thank you, Dave. And maybe you could say a little bit about why you think it's been slower in some areas for predictive analytics to be used in this manner. I think part of it is because they haven't had to. You know, the students keep showing up and they keep basically putting up and, uh, and they're paying more for it. Uh, most industries, if you could, could uh, charge more for the same product, uh, you do so, that's sort of how markets work. But, and we've been able to do that for a long period of time. I think one of the dilemmas we've got too, and we've got to kind of get over this and, and get to the public agenda part of this, is that students who come from disadvantaged backgrounds are more expensive to serve. They need more services. And as a result, they're not a cheap way to essentially get uh, more bang for the buck. And uh, and so institutions have naturally uh, gravitated to other students and to cheaper, um, less effective strategies for those for these disadvantaged students. Um, and that that's not brand new to us. I mean, that used to be the story as well for a long period of time. It was not noted that institutions made their money off of freshmen and spent it on seniors. And uh, so this isn't a brand new theory but we've got to find a way in which those freshmen actually get to be seniors. Uh, and that's, that's not cheap. Thank you, Dave. And Pat, do you have any comments you'd like to add on that? Uh, just to say, the, uh, as Dave suggested, the economic incentives are 
weak are not really embedded very solidly in state accountability systems. And for the institutions, uh, it isn't a question of knowledge. Yeah, we have new tools and new knowledge we can develop, but uh, we know enough based on existing experience to that, there's, that it pretty uh, it pretty much uh, eliminates any kind of excuses uh, that this is something we couldn't make significant progress on with the right uh, set of, uh, of policies, practices, and commitments. Thank you, Pat. I have another question, and this is also to all panelists. With the free college movement and more attention being paid to workforce development at both the federal and state levels, could you talk about the new tensions between public two and public four-year sectors over a ten, um, I'm guessing this is retention, enrollment, and funding streams? We can start with Dennis. Why do you pick on me every time? Uh, <laughs> Keeping the order. <laughs> You're the guru, Dennis. <laughs> no, I mean, this, this is one where, <laughs> you know, David said it earlier that, that free college is one of those that things that in a state where you have very low participation rates in post-secondary education, you might say it's a really good device in the PR sense to, to make the point that more, many more students can go to college than currently are. But if you were to say, what's the best way to allocate scarce resources to make sure that more students succeed in college, that wouldn't be where you start. Uh, and the other piece of all of this is, you know, and all three of us have worked in many different ways uh, of saying that <laughs> one of the most important things that we are going to have to do is to make sure that we connect the dots on finance policy. I mean, higher education finance policy that focuses on institutions separately from student support, separately from tuition policy, separately from institutional productivity is policy that is wasteful and never gets us to the solutions that we're really looking for. We can't afford to have all of the fiscal policy trains operating independently on their own tracks. Uh, to the point about uh, two year versus four year, uh, you know, I would I would argue that in many cases, uh, because the audience that needs to be addressed is the adult audience, uh, we're really talking not even about associate degrees, but we're talking about certificates of value as the important starting point for students. Programs, certificates that give them a leg up on uh, the economic ladder gets them a, a job that pays a living wage is is a set of act is a set of programs that higher education is badly underinvested in. As long as we think that the only programs that matter are those that are either associate or baccalaureate degrees, we're missing a big part of the need, the demand in higher education. Thank you, Senator. Dave, do you have sure. any comments? Sure, Sarah. I, I think one of the things, this is an area where I think performance funding and policy can also be helpful. Uh, you know, if you have uh, performance funding that follows completers, uh, a completer of a six-month program gets you your money a lot quicker than a completer of a four-year program. And so some of the incentives that uh, are sort of natural or disincentives that are naturally built in uh, to our old traditional model uh, would be different if, if you had a heavier focus on that. So I think this is an area where our policies, as Dennis says, you've got to bring all of those finance policies together. We also have to find a way in which we make it affordable both to the state and the students for adults to come back because um, um, 
you know, they all look like they have no resources, but you've got to find a way in which you can legitimately make it affordable to the students, but at a price that's affordable to the state. And I would say to the institutions, one of the dilemmas with many of the free tuition plans is that they eliminated an important source of revenue, tuition revenue. Uh, and if you're reducing the amount of resources available to serve students, at the same time you're asking, you're increasing uh, the, the, the number of those students who want to go to school, you've got to disconnect. So I think that this is, this is fairly complicated work but it's not impossible work. I mean, we, we can put this together. Dennis has the diagrams, he can prove it. Uh, I've seen them. So that we can, we can do this. It's just not easy to do. Thank you, Dave. And we're running a little short on time, so I'm gonna get to another question that we were just asked. Um, so where are business and employer, in, or employer interests and, and actions in this? Is it, you know, they will arrange for their employee, employees to be trained, or is it leaning more on higher education to respond to their interests? So maybe being active in the policy arena, or is it a partner or cooperation or mutual and multiple benefit? And is this to good effect or not? And Dennis, we can start with, or let's start with Pat since he didn't get a chance to respond on the last one. Okay, well, it's hard to believe. Uh, it's a good question, but it's very hard to believe there's kind of a generic answer to it. It's probably, you know, all of the above, depending on the, uh, you know, uh, de depending on the state, the community, the industry, and the needs. I, it's hard for me to see this sorting itself out in a way that there could be a good uh, 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 kind of national, um, uh, um, you know, Answer to this, it, 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 and 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 and, uh, 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 and uh, unlike the previous question, where I think public policy uh, could 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 really uh, 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 you know could really uh, create the uh, instant demand for a solution to uh, 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 to dealing with those tensions. Uh, here, I think this is going to be a much more localized. Um, uh, uh, issue. Yeah, I want to jump in on this one because I think we tend to think of when we're we're thinking about these, we hear about the partnerships of Walmart, Starbucks, and and uh, and others in this reign, and those are nice things. But most jobs, most new jobs, most emerging jobs are in small businesses, and uh, it seems to me that. Trying to find, uh, yeah, you can work on partnerships locally on that, but I'm not, sh I think public policy still has to say that it's our primary responsibility to make sure that workforce is developed and not expect industry to basically do it because small, small industries simply don't have the resources, particularly at their evolution, to do that. And that's where the new jobs are being created. Yeah. I would just add one one thing to that, and and that is that we expect colleges and universities to prepare students to be fully productive on day one when they go to work, and <clears throat> I think that's asking too much. Uh, and one of the ways around that is, I would argue for the much broader use of paid internships that provide a mechanism for students to earn a paycheck while they learn at the same time they learn workplace skills in a way that really help them hit the hit the employment market with a set of skills and abilities they otherwise don't get sally we're out of time for us yeah. <clears throat> okay listen this has been great liz could we go to the very last slide and I want to thank Dennis Jones, David Longenecker, and Pat Callen for sharing their perspectives on this deep issue, uh, both what's happened and where we might go. And thank you for participating in the first of our 50th anniversary webinars. On April 1st, we're going to be presenting our second in this series, and Brian Prescott will host Aaron Thompson and Jason Lane in a discussion that reflects the issues around state higher education systems.
So please go to the NCHEMS website to register. And this webinar will be archived at NCHEMS.org and we encourage you to share that link with others that you think might enjoy it. Thank you again and that's it.